します。Hello and good evening. Welcome everyone. Today is the fourth talk of the resident series of webinar for the ACNS. On behalf of the President Professor Yoko Kato and the Education Committee of the ACNS, I welcome you all to this grand webinar. As you all know, the organization of Cerebral White Matter is a very vital to knowledge to all the neurosurgeons, and it is an indispensable part of neurosurgery and neuroanatomy. Today we have with us none other than the, one of the most uh, talented researchers of uh, cerebral white matter, who will talk about us. He is Professor Igor Maldonado. Professor, I welcome you to this webinar, and uh, I request you to please take over and start your webinar talk. Professor Igor, please. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. For me, it's a great honor and, of course, a great pleasure to meet you today and to start this uh, discussion. So I hope you, this will be uh, interesting for, for everybody. I'm trying to share my screen. Do, do you yeah, see? Yeah, we, we see that. Okay. Perfect. So, The study of the uh, organization of the cerebral white matter is a subject that's not very often discussed in the anatomy courses, right? In our uh, surgical and even radiological practice, we have a tendency to be uh, much more precise for everything uh, that regards the gray matter. In our topographic diagnosis, for example, neurological examination, writing our reports, we are always uh, trying to understand the symptoms, neurological symptoms of a given patient in functions of the cortical centers, for example. And sometimes we forget about some very important eloquent structures in the white matter. So although the uh, anatomical studies about the connectivity, they, uh, they date for more than three centuries now, there is uh, this less precise understanding of the fascicles that compose the white matter. And the main uh, reason for this is methodological. Actually, when you see uh, fresh cadavers, as you see here in anatomy laboratory, or using the conventional uh, preparations, anatomical preparations, the, uh, the white matter is amorphous. You don't really see the, uh, the fascicles inside it. And that's the same for conventional radiological techniques, such as this morphological tube, T1 MRI, when you have no DTI, right? So even though we know that the, uh, the cerebral white matter is organized in fascicles, that actually they are just groups of fibers that in their turn or groups or axons, we know that they are there, but we don't see them. The anatomical studies have uh, progressed a lot since the works of uh, Ludwig and Klingler in the 50s mainly. Klingler uh, very intelligently, uh, he's, he observed that the, this effect of augmentation in volume of the water when it's frozen, then he deduced that including an intermediary step of freezing in the preparation, in the anatomical preparation, the crystallization of molecules of water and formalin inside the brain could slightly spread the elements of white matter. And then the clinker technique is the one we are going to use here with some modification, thanks to a collaboration with the different laboratories uh, in France, the Toulouse Laboratory and Montpellier School of Medicine Laboratory. So we have to analyze all members of the lab and people who help do this. So let me show in some words, how we do this. So first, the cadaver is fixed in formula, and then the skull is open, trying to preserve the, preserve the dura as much as possible, so the encephalo can be removed entirely. So with almost no risk of blessing the parenchyma. So you have a nice uh, cerebral specimen to, uh, to study. And then all the meninges are delicately removed and the encephalo goes then to a congelation, to freezing during at least 15 days. 
uh, we can freeze uh, twice or even three times when you want to get a very good result. And then the crystallization of formalin and water inside the tissues changes the, the color and the consistency of the parenchyma. Um, yeah. Uh, so the gray matter is now darker and is also brittle, friable, so it breaks easily. And then you can easily remove the gray matter from the white matter that keeps a firm consistency. So you can, for example, in this specimen, we removed the gray matter and we, and we exposed the superficial uh, subcortical white matter which mainly made of short U association fibers, U fibers. So um, this, uh, the spreading of the tissue spaces inside the gray matter makes fibers uh, visible, uh, dissectable, and that's the same for the cortex and for deep white matter such as the uh, uh, gray nuclei, for example. And of course, we can uh, we can uh, help our dissection with the, the surgical microscope, and then try to see delicate fasciculi that would we, we would never see with uh, traditional anatomical uh, preparations or even uh, during uh, during uh, live surgery. So we can follow then groups of fibers for several centimeters and then classify them. Uh, this is a general classification, very classical one. Uh, according to the zones, the different bundles connect. Bordak was the main uh, researcher who was responsible for this classification, but was not the only one. So the association bundles or association fascicli are those that connect to different areas in the same cerebral hemisphere. That's the case, for example, of the superior longitudinal fasciculus, but also the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, middle longitudinal fasciculus, inferior frontal longitudinal fasciculus, inferior front occipital fasciculus. So those are all fiber bundles that are coming from somewhere in the cortex and get you to somewhere else in the cortex, but in the same cerebral hemisphere. And then we have the projection, projection bundles or projection fascicles, fascicles. They connect zones with the different levels of integration in the central nervous system. For example, diencephalon with telencephalon, telencephalon with a spinal cord, spinal cord and the brain. So classic examples are corona radiata and internal capsule. So they are vertical ones, but there is not only verticals. We have, for example, optic radiations. Optic radiations uh, they are connecting metathalamus, which is the lateral geniculate body, to the cortex, which are the lips of the coparent fissure. So we have different levels of integration. So even though if it's a horizontal bundle, it's considered a projection fascicle. And finally, we have the uh, commissural fasciculi, uh, which are those that cross the midline and connect the hemispheres, the two cerebral hemispheres. So, of course, the main example is the corporal scalosum, but we can also mention the anterior commissure, the posterior commissure. And even the fornix may also be considered a commissure of fascicle too, because of the hypocampal commissure between the two bodies of the fornix. Fornix is a very interesting fascicle, we're going to see a little bit, a little bit in a while. Uh, it may be considered a, a commissure of fascicle, fascicle, as I told you. It may be considered a projection fascicle because it's coming from the mammillary body to uh, the middle aspect of the temporal lobe. So it's a diencephalon and telencephalon. And uh, it may also be considered an association fasciculi, fasciculus because it's connecting the temporal lobe also with a small portion of the, uh, of the septal area of the subcalosal cortex. So we have fibers with different behaviors, association fibers, projection fibers, and commissural fibers in the same fascicle. Okay, so for the understanding of this, we're going to organize uh, differently. We're not going to apply exactly uh, this order. We'll progress from the periphery of the hemisphere to the depth. So it means that we're going to start with the cerebral cortex of the lateral aspect, and then we'll finish with the medial aspect of the same cerebral hemisphere, step by step. So this is a brain, 
that was prepared for fiber dissection using the clinkers technique. So it's a lateral aspect. The meninges were removed. We recognize the gyri, the sulci. So you see lateral sulcos, right? Central sulcos. So this is frontal lobe with the superior, middle, and inferior uh, frontal gyri. So in the inferior frontal gyri, you see gyros, we see the three oceans, class ones. So I have uh, orbit, um, orbital, triangular, and opercular uh, portions. The parietal lobe, we see there with the uh, superior parietal lobule and the inferior parietal lobule with the supramarginal gyros and angular gyros. In the temporal lobe, two main sulci, uh, superior longitudinal, uh, sorry, superior temporal sulcos and inferior temporal sulcos. The superior temporal sulcos is most of cases a continual sulcos. The inferior temporal sulcos in most of cases discontinuous sulcos. And then you have this, those pleated passage, those links, those links between the middle temporal gyros and the inferior temporal gyros. So you have two, two sulci delimiting limiting the three gyri and the inferior temporal gyros is part of the inferior border of the, uh, this lateral aspect of the cerebral hemisphere, such as the superior frontal gyros were part of the superior border of the, um, of the uh, cerebral hemisphere. The occipital lobe is a small lobe, more irregular, with uh, three main circumvolutions, one superior, one middle, one inferior. Uh, as I explained to you, the gray matter of this specimen is now fried, fragile, is brittle, and can be removed. So I can study some white matter for it. So the first thing we noted is when we remove the cortex, is that we do not penetrate immediately in the semi-wall center. There is a layer of firm white matter that covers each sulcus of the cerebral surface. So this layer is smooth at the depth of the sulci, but is quite rolls in their uh, more superficial portion at the top of the gyrus. When you take a look, quite a detailed look at this and you zoom it, you understand why it is like this. So the subcortical layer, superficial layer of white matter is made by an infinity of fibers that are transversal or slightly obliquely oriented, but they are covering each sulcus of the cerebral surface. So the visible portion of these fibers terminate predominantly at the level of the top of each gyrus. So they receive a different names in the literature short U association fibers because of the form like a letter U, uh, intergyral fibers or even sub just subcortical fibers and they can be removed easily. You see in this figure, in this picture in the top left, how they are, of course you have to also terminations at the depth of the soul site, but they are so more organized at the top of the, uh, of the, of the gyro that you have this uh, this kind of uh, aspect and disposition, okay? So to advance inside the same over center, we have to remove them. So we started to do this in, with this specimen. Note that rapidly we, we see uh, the presence of very long fibers that are very different and they are horizontally oriented inside the frontal and parietal lobes. So this PC is seen, that's the case in this specimen, and the most lateral portion of the semi center here. So we know that this is part of this superior longitudinal fasciculus that we will begin to expose. So superior longitudinal fasciculus is a very important element of the white matter. And uh, we need to detail a little bit more. Um, it's a very voluminous one. And there is a lot of effort to understand a lot of research, to understand the different parts of these fasciculus. And uh, actually, uh, the most correct way of interpret this is not to say only superior longitudinal fasciculus at a single fasciculus, 
but actually as a complex, as an association complex made, uh, made up of different components. So these are some of the classifications that exist, the most complete ones. This one is based on the anatomy of the rhesus monkey. Why the rhesus monkey? Because one of the main techniques for detailed anatomical studies of these fascicles, of this uh, detailed what matter, is radioisotope tracing. So it's autoreogeography. And of course, you can not do this kind of experimental study in humans. So it's done mostly in a rhesus monkey. So for the horizontal portion of the superior longitudinal fasciculus, three, three components are identified and they are numbered. We see SLF1, SLF2, and SLF3. And when you go to MRI studies, diffusion studies, and you do DTI, for example, GSI, and those, all those techniques of uh, diffusion imaging, you see that at least part of this anatomy can be reproduced with MRI. And so you have disposition of these horizontal fibers in different components. Of course, if you take all together, you see all this is superior longitudinal fasciculus, but they are organized. You have a, a package of them that is uh, more or less at the level of the superior frontal gyrus, for example. And this is SLF1. You have a big package of them, which is in the middle of the semovar center, more or less at the level of the SLF, uh, or the level of the middle frontal gyrus. Then you say it's SLF2. And then you see, you see that you have a package that is the bottom portion of the semovar center, quite more lateral, you know, at the level of the inferior frontal gyros, at the level of the supramarginal gyros, the frontal parietal operculum, and then you see it's a left left tree. These three different portions, and they also receive the names in the literature. We say this one is the dorsal component of the SLF complex. This one is the uh, major component, SLF2, and this one is the ventral or the opercular component of the SLF, SLF3. So there's the same to see, say SLF1, 2, and 3, it's the same to say dorsal, major, and ventral opercular component. So another very, very important element of this complex is that uh, maybe even the most important component of this, com of this uh, complex is the arcuate fasciculus. The arcuate fasciculus for a long time has been referred as a synonym of a superior longitudinal fasciculus, but when you dissect, when you take a look with some detail, more detail in a, in a magnetic resonance imaging studies, you see that arcuate should not, this term should not be used as a synonym of superior longitudinal fasciculus, simply because arcuate is not longitudinal. But it's often you study it together, and so it's, it would be the fourth component, okay? And the uh, arcuate fibers, they are deeper than those, all those ones, and they will run around the limiting circles of the insula. So try to imagine you're operating on an a, 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 a insular case, for example, or dissecting a cadaver, so the insula would be here, the limited circles, the circular circles of the insula will be around it, and then quite close to it, you have those arcuate fibers that are coming from the frontal lobe to the temporal lobe. So they're very long ones. So they're connecting, for example, Broca's area to Wernicke's area. So it's very important for language. It was very uh, uh, Wernicke engagement in their uh, model for uh, language treatment in the brain, they gave a lot of importance to uh, this fascicle for a lot of functions in language treatment, right? So, so that's one, two, three, arcuate, and the last component, the most recent one was uh, first introduced in a uh, diffusal image by a guy who's named Katani, uh, is the posterior component. What is the posterior component? You see, those fibers I showed you are all of them horizontal or arcuate. But of course, you also have some shorter ones that are here connecting parietal to temporal lobe. 
So this is an exception. Here you have a frontal parietal connection. Here you have a frontal temporal connection. Here you have parietal temporal connection. So this is a posterior, what we call the posterior component. So we have five things, five things to remember here. SLF one, two, three, arcuate, and the posterior component or posterior segment, if you prefer. So when we try to met, uh, to uh, put everything of, uh, to show everything of this uh, in the in the lab, the easiest point to get inside the uh, the semovo center usually is the supramarginal gyrus. So this is a posterior lateral view of the cerebral hemisphere. This is frontal and parietal lobe. This is temporal lobe. So this is lateral sulcus and this is superior temporal sulcus. So when we remove all that superficial white matter and the, uh, you were looking for uh, the, the longer ones, the first ones we see here are those vertical ones. They're the, then coming from the temporal lobe to the parietal lobe and vice versa. So this is part of the posterior component, right? And then this is lateral and superior perspective. So frontal lobe is there, temporal lobe is here. So you see there those vertical fibers we dissected first. Those are horizontal ones. And when you took a careful look on those horizontal ones, some of them are quite superficial, right? Some of them are in the deep portions of the, um, of the, of the operculum. They're not really in the center of the end of the SMFO center. Those, so those fibers are part of the SLF3, of the ventral opercular component of the matrix classification I showed you. But then if you go deeper and deeper inside the water matter, and if you do exactly the opposite that what we were doing before, means that you don't look at the operculum. You even take part of the opercula, of the opercula out, and you look for the white matter which is deep even closer to those vertical ones we see here, which, which are part of the corona radiata. And then you see very long ones there was, that, are, that are running around the insula, around, I'm sorry, around the cerebral fissure, and those are part of, of the arc rate fascicles. So this is the fourth component. So this is the arc rate itself. So it's part of, of the complex. It's not a synonym of SLF, okay? So it's a very important thing. If I forget the operculum and then I concentrate now in the semi over center, I see very robust, big package of fibers. There are frontal parietal in uh, direction, and it is a, a more or less at the middle of the uh, of the semi over center. They are more or less at the level of F F two of the middle frontal gyrus. So this is the major component of the class of macros classification. So this is the major component, it is SLF2. So there is some confusion uh, in, in the literature. The first, the first classifications didn't consider all those components. Or the, uh, the recent one now, they, they consider, consider everything. But there is something I have to uh, detail for you. As um, I showed you then, ventral, Operacular component, major, arcuate, that would something do something like this. I show you do the vertical posterior component with the uh, parietal temporal fibers, but I didn't show you in that section the SLF1, which was the first one I showed you on the Rezus Monkey and in the MRI. The SLF1 is the dorsal component that runs along the superior border of the cerebral hemisphere. So let's take a look in the table of this. This is a dissection we did in the lab. Actually, these slices, they are not horizontal. They were cut along the superior border of the cerebral hemisphere. So we can uh, follow those fibers and dissect them. And actually, when you do this in humans, given, to, given the uh, high degree of jurification we have in humans, you have a lot of uh, short soci. They are uh, perpendicular, transverse to this region. The medial aspect of the fibro hemisphere in humans, it contains, it contains a lot of soci there. So in human brains, 
you see many, of course, short tube association fibers, but also regional fibers. They are coming from the frontal lobe to the frontal lobe or to the frontal lobe, a little bit in the parietal lobe and the, in the parietal lobe to uh, further in the, in the parietal lobe. But don't be astonished if when dissecting uh, or working with uh, MRI imaging, if you cannot find a very long fasciculus coming from near the uh, frontal pole to the parietal, parietal uh, lobe. So this is it's some, it's quite polemic subject, but some differences uh, really uh, seems to exist between our anatomy and uh, the monkey's anatomy, what was used to uh, base the fertility studies, okay? So, we're getting deeper and deeper inside the, the uh, white matter of the, um, of the lateral aspect. So let's uh, now get back to the cortex and do exactly the same that we did to the insula. Okay, so you see uh, the insular lobe here. It's a very classic um, characteristic as morphological aspect. The insula may be compared as a pyramid, which is the base is triangular. And the apex of the pyramid uh, looks to the uh, opening of the cesium fissure. Actually, here the orpercola were, uh, and the cesium fissure was open, so you see the frontal parietal and temporal opercula there, there. But when the cesium fissure is closed, uh, you have a, a more or less at this level. Uh, CSF lake is more opening, which is very often in relation with the fact that the triangular portion of the inferior frontal gyrus is retracted at this level. It is what we call the anterior cesium point. And as you probably know, is one of the best places to restart of the dissection of a cesium fissure for vascular neurosurgery, for example. But actually, when you look at the anterior cesium point, you can see very often part of the insula. And the part of the insula that you see is the apex. So the apex of the insula, the apex of this triangular pyramid is the lateral most portion of the insula. And then you have gyri that are coming to this apex. Those are the short insula gyrus, gyri. And then you have the central sulcus of the insula, which this position direction is quite similar to the central sulcus of the brain and then you have the long gyre of the insula and around all this you have the limited sulcus of the insula or circular sulcus of the insula we can talk about an anterior limited sulcus and superior limited sulcus and the inferior or posterior inferior limited sulcus okay and then something that's very uh, also important anatomical detail is this pleated passage this link between frontal lobe and temporal lobe, which is the anterior inferior portion of the insula, which is the limen. You see, the limen is a very important landmark for us, the study what matter, to find the two uh, white matter fasciculi here, which are the incinate and the IFOF. And the IFOF is uh, also important fasciculus for uh, some intraparenchymal approaches for gliomas, for example, because in the cerebral hemisphere, which is dominant for language, for example, the left hemisphere for most of right-handed people, there is a lot of semantic function in the IFOF, in the inferior front occipital fasciculus. And as you're going to see in the dissection, IFOF, we're going to find it just there. And uh, of course, just before it, uh, before and uh, yeah, just anterior, to the limit of the insula, to the, uh, we are in the subarachnoid space, and this is the place we're going to find the middle cerebral artery turning um, superior, and this is of, very often the, uh, the transition between the trunk of the middle cerebral artery and the branches, the, the frontal and temporal divisions. So this is the transition between M1 and M2 segments, of uh, MCA according to the Fisher classification. So when you take the cortex out, 
the first thing you see is quite amorphous white matter, right? So you don't see fibers very well. They're coming to the opercula, to the frontal parietal opercula, to the temporal operculum. And they're drawing for us also the soci and gyri of the surface of the insula. So it is more or less the equivalent of what we did for the lateral aspect of the brain. This is subcortical white matter. Of course, I have some U fibers there, a lot of U fibers there. But we're not very used to look at this perspective. We are used to study the insula and the gray and nuclei, looking at cuts, slices, or MRI, for example. So this is nothing less than the external cap, the extreme capsule. So this is extreme capsule, but it's not extreme capsule in a cut in an MRI examination, it's in extreme capsula in this, in, with this, uh, it's a three-dimensional shape, right? And then when we remove those fibers, then now you see very organized one, ones. And then those are very easy to see, right? They are long, they are very organized, and you start to identify things. So this is external capsula. And between external capsula and extreme capsula, we have a small amount of gray matter, which is part of a, a basal ganglion, which is the claustrum. And actually, the claustrum, as you know, it, it's so thin, it's so delicate, that when you take the external extreme capsule out and you start to dissect the external capsule, you take out most of the claustrum. And some islands of gray matter, some islands of clostrum stay, and that's what we were seeing here, right? So this is part of clostrum. And all the rest there is part of external capsula. And you see that external capsula is then made up of two different portions. One is anterior inferior, and this anterior inferior portion, we can find thick, very organized fasciculi, such as the uncinate fasciculus connecting frontal lobe and temporal lobe. And you see the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus connecting frontal lobe and temporal lobe, but it's a very long one. The inferior frontal occipital fasciculus go very far posteriorly up to the occipital lobe. So this inferior frontal occipital fasciculus is the one I told you is related to language functions, semantic functions even verbal and non-verbal semantic functions. So for, for people that works with uh, gliomas, for example, uh, that are doing awake surgery, when you stimulate, when you disturb electrically the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, you can uh, see your patient manifest semantic disturbances, for example, have problems in picturing naming or in uh, some neuropsychological tests or this kind of thing. So for the dominant hemisphere, uh, is an important is an important bundle to uh, to preserve, and then you see the limit of the insula dissected, and just anterior and medial to it, what is that? The middle cerebral artery. Okay, so in this specimen, we also see that the posterior superior portion of the external capsule is made of mostly centrifugal fibers, so very different for an anterior and inferior portion. Here we have frontal parietal bundles. And here you have a centrifugal portions. They are coming from the claustrum and from the lateral aspects of the epitome and they are going to uh, several different sites in the cortex. And they are joining this. This is the corona radiata. So what we're seeing here is the uh, fibers of the corona radiata, they were spreading like this. And then fibers from the external capsula, they are joining the corona radiata. And this is lateral aspect of the epitome. So let's get inside deeper and deeper. We're going to take the lenticular nucleus out, okay? We're going to take the epitome out. And as you know, those fibers of the corona radiata at a more inferior level, they are coming from the internal capsula, right? So what this picture is showing for this is that for us is that the corona radiata actually is made up of fibers that are coming from the, uh, the internal capsule and fibers that are coming from the external capsule and in the middle, in the middle of this triangle, you have the lenticular nucleus. 
So I have some, uh, some dissections of this, okay? And you see that you have some uh, fibers that are cut there, they were broken. Uh, because during the dissection, of course, we move the operculum and a lot of things. But one of the things we had here before dissection was the arcuate fasciculus. This is also a very interesting concept. The arcuate fasciculus was there, just like this, around the insula. So also, once again, for people that do uh, gliomas and uh, insular tumors or whatever, when you're aspirating inside the insula, okay, and uh, you're getting close to the limitant sucrose of the insula, mostly the superior limitant sucrose of the insula, actually you're very close to corona radiata fibers, and you're very close to this horizontal portion of the arcuate fasciculus. So that's why, even if you're not very deep, but you are far with your instructor, you can get uh, motor problems or even language problems with insular tumors. Another very uh, interesting and important concept is uh, I was talking about the IFOF, which, which is there. So this very long, very long fasciculus. Uh, I'm interrupted here because actually it is uh, deeper than arcuate in the temporal lobe. Uh, let's suppose you, you're operating uh, also a glioma, a wake surgery, you're in the left hemisphere and you are simulating here and you get, let's say, semantic paraphasia and then you decide to stop. Okay, but let's suppose you don't stop. If you don't stop, you're seeing the dissection. What do you get, get there is the lateral aspect that you determine and inside this region, we have all the perforators that are coming from the middle cerebral artery. So we have the lenticulate straight arteries there. Okay, so this is a nice, nice landmark also for surgery. Uh, mostly, uh, most cases will, you see the function, you are not going to see the bundle. So monitorization is very important here. And uh, it may, you, you, may, you may take the, um, we should consider the IFOF as a, a friend, actually, <laughs> actually, that is telling to us, okay, you have language function here, you have semantic function here, so be careful, lenticular straight theater is a lot far. So these are very interesting details of anatomy that in my opinion, they help a lot in surgery. So it's another cerebral hemisphere. So it's the, this is the right one. So this is a frontal lobe, this is temporal lobe. So this is anterior. This is posterior. So this is the same thing. Uh, so this is the limen of the insula, so oncinate fasciculus, front occipital fasciculus, inferior front occipital fasciculus. This is our some islands of clostrum. So we open the window at the level of the external capsula. So you see once again the lateral aspect of the pitamen. You see uh, corona radiata fibers, and you see fibers of the external capsula getting into the corona radiata, right? And then you see this. This is white matter that was cut. So at this region, you had, of course, part of the superior uh, longitudinal fasciculus complex. But there's also a lot of callosal fibers that are coming from the other side of the brain. And they are reflecting here to, to connect to the superior aspect of the cerebral, cerebral, cerebral hemisphere. So they are coming from the other side, and they are doing this. Those are called the uh, dorsal callosal radiations. And though you have this kind of bulging, always, always, this kind of bulging in the cerebral hemisphere, which are also important landmark for ventricles, I'll show you. So you see the, the, uh, the bulging there, okay? You see the bulging there. So the coronary radiata is not flat. You see this kind of bulging, okay? And I know that in this region, I have not only coronary radiata fibers, but I have some, also, some callosal ones. And as I know, the corpus callosum is, uh, forms the uh, roof of the, uh, of the ventricle. It means that if, if I want to find the ventricle, the anterior horn, I should puncture here, not there, okay? So I know that the, 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 uh, the anterior horn of the ventricle is there. Actually, if, if I imagine now the, the frontal operculum, the frontal operculum was there, right? So th this is a very interesting projection. So I have the frontal operculum, 
then you have port of the coronary jata, then I am under the corpus callosum, and then I get to the ventricle. So this is a inferior frontal occipital fasciculus dissected, isolated, so you see it goes very far. And this region, which corresponds to the lateral wall of the ventricular atrium, we have a lot of uh, horizontal fibers there. So that region is called the sagittal stratum. And this part of the sagittal stratum is the posterior segment of IFOF, of inferior frontal occipital fasciculus. Uh, there are a lot of things there, also colossal radiations are there and some other small fasciculi. Uh, IFOF, uh, there is some discussion of, uh, in the literature. So this is a left fibral hemisphere. Uh, so we have here frontal lobe or uh, occipital lobe there. So you see very classical IFOF, IFOF I showed you. But there are some discussion about some terminations that could exist in the parietal lobe also, uh, actually. So uh, they were almost uh, completely uh, acknowledged now, recognized now. So this is a nice, uh, uh, let me see, um, uh, general, general view. So we have a lot of things there. So on second lateral aspect, so frontal lobe, temporal, and this is posterior. So coincinate, we have a front occipital fasciculus there, sagittal stratum, uh, centrifugal fibers of the, uh, of the external capsula, uh, lateral aspect of putamen, coronary jet again, that bulging I told you, part of the arcuate that was left, so you see nice relationship between arcuate, coronary jata, external capsula, etc. And this forming the uh, inferior edge of the dissection is the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, uh, which is uh, also an important, very, um, very large fasciculus, which is part of the temporal lobe, is part of the sagittal stratum, and have some also some surgical implications. So let's take uh, some minutes to uh, some seconds to take a look of this small fasciculus there. So this is left cerebral hemisphere, so it's the sagittal stratum, occipital lobe is there. So this is the uh, temporal operculum being dissected. So uh, you get back just one slide, then you see that in order to see IFOF, you have it to be quite deep. The uh, whole temporal operculum there was removed. So the question we can ask if some fibers coming from the sector stratum are actually staying quite superficial and not getting all of them inside the deep portions of the temporal lobe. Actually, some, some of them really do. And that's what we call the middle longitudinal fasciculus is a small one, okay? And the deep portions of that region, I'll come back again. So sagittal stratum is there. So this arcuate fasciculus, I show you the, showed you the inferior front occipital fasciculus. So the deep layer of the sagittal stratum, you have this. This is a right hemisphere. This is anterior, this is posterior. What is this? These are optic radiations. So this is metatalamus, this is lateral geniculate bodies, and you have a lot of fibers that are getting to the lips of the calcarine fissure. So we are looking at the calcarine fissure, but from the lateral side, not from the medial side, okay? So some, some fibers, they are, uh, they are getting inferior and uh, going to the, um, to the inferior lip of the calcarine fissure. Then you have the uh, Myers loop, then they will come near to the uh, occipital pole, then they will continue, continue, and the parietal ones will arch a little bit in the parietal lobe and get now to the superior lip of the calcarine fissure. I, I can comment on this during the discussion. There is a very beautiful retinotopy in this fiber. Each fiber there corresponds to a different region of, of the retina. I would love to explain this, but uh, we don't have time, unfortunately. So this is an inferior view, same, same thing, same kind of dissection. So we see the brainstem there, part of the chiasma was cut, uh, opti tract, lateral geniculoid body, pulvinar. So this is the Meyer's loop, and this is the calcarine fissure, right? So this is the inferior lip of the calcarine fissure, and this is the occipital pole. So this is the anterior lip of the calcarine fissure, it corresponds to the superior quadrant uh, of the contralateral a field of view. 
Okay, so uh, look that to dissect those palazzo radiations, we were obliged to open the ventricle lodging. So this is the mayor look around the temporal horn of the ventricle. We were obliged to remove the appendima. And when you remove the appendima, actually, you don't see immediately the colossal radiations. You have some fibers that are very different in direction. First thing you see, uh, let me draw it. When you remove the appendima, you see fibers like this first, and then you have to remove them. Yeah. What is happening? Those fibers actually are fibers that are coming directly from the corpus callosum. So it's a corpus callosum dissected. There's a, actually when you think about corpus callosum, you think immediately about the images we see in MRI of the sagittal cuts. But actually corpus callosum is not this. Corpus callosum is a huge commissural complex fibers are crossing in lines and then they are going everywhere and they are going everywhere uh, inferior superior and then when you dissect the corpus callosum you see this from lateral aspect you see this the rostrum the genu the body of the corpus callosum the istimo would be like this and then you don't see this planum why you don't see this planum they say it would be there because some fibers some ventral callosal fibers they are getting, getting inferiorly and they are covering the lateral wall of the ventricular artery. Actually, if I puncture there, I will get CSF, ventricular artery. If you look here, you have a pendulum. This is the roof of the lateral ventricle. And so, and so this colossal fibers that are covering lateral of the ventricle, of the atrium, this is the tapetum, okay? And that's what you see here. This is middle perspective. So this is thalamo, these are some thalamic irradiations, and you see those, those fibers there. So this is corpus callosum, of course, cut and dissected, and you see some fibers are getting down. So this is the tapetum, okay? Lateral aspect. So once again, putamen, corona radiata, part of the corona radiata, may you see in this dissection, we could differentiate, you have two different components of fibers, some of them are more ephemeral, some of them are not, some of them are more lateral, some of them are more medial. What is happening here? That most projection fibers, even though they are intermingled, huh? but, but most projection fibers coming from internal capsula, for example, they are lateral. And those commissural fibers that are coming from the other hemisphere to get to the superior, to the superior border of the cerebral hemisphere, they are more a uh, medial. Okay? So we have this nice organization that we can see here in this picture. This is corporal callosums dissected bilaterally uh, together with the corona radiata in superior view. So when you are in superior view, you're coming as we are doing from lateral to medial. We get the corona radiata there. And you see that the superior border of the hemisphere, you have different contingents of fibers. And then you have this thing that will explain you. And then you have the callosal fibers that are crossing the middle. So this thing in the middle, or longitudinal fibers like this. So these longitudinal fibers, or this, the singulum, singulate bundle. And, oh, where is my, my pen? <laughs> I, I lost it. So, so actually what is beautiful in this session, as you see that, those dorsal callosal radiations there, those callosal fibers that are connecting the two cerebral hemispheres, they are obliged to dive below this pool to get to cross the midline and to get to the other side. So this is a very uh, interesting, very beautiful sequence. We see very, very nice with a, with the uh, AFIC ma maps in MRI. So coronary radiata, callosal radiations, uh, singular, and finally horizontal and callosal fibers there. Oh. So that's a uh, medial aspect. And uh, in this uh, uh, top uh, right uh, corner here there, we dissected the frontal, uh, superior frontal gyrus, very near to the central sulcus. Huh? So we are uh, at the level of the uh, paracentral level. And you see that those fibers it could be uh, connecting, for example, uh, the, um, could be connecting the, uh, the lower limb uh, motor region, for example, because the central sulcus are just there. Uh, they dive 
they pass under this cingulum and then they go to the other side. And then when you dissect the, uh, the middle aspect, they would be a, a, a very a long, large subject. We, I would let you discuss this, but we will take another, another lecture. We can uh, see very different elements of the medial aspect too, even those that very often we study when there are medical school and anatomy courses as part of the limbic circuit and the palpus circuit. But often when we study this, uh, most people teach our boxes and arrows. So what is very nice with fiber dissection is you see uh, what those arrows correspond. So what all the anatomical superstruct of the connections. For example, here. We have part of the hypocampus and the uh, uh, parahypocampal gyri that are dissected. So hypocampus and middle are cut sagittally. And then you see the finger and the fornix, um, posterior, uh, uh, posterior um, limb of the fornix, uh, the body of the fornix and the anterior limb of the fornix. Then get it to the mammillary body. Then you see the uh, mammillothalamic tract, the old victor Z tract that gets it to the anterior nuclei of the thalami. Then, if you take a look inside the ventricle, you see that part of the caudate nucleus were removed. So you see uh, the thalamic radiations, which anatomically is just the middle aspect of the coronal radiata we were looking before. And then it gets to the cingulate gyrus. And inside the cingulate gyrus, you have the cingulate bundle that I just showed you. And this cingulate bundle is getting back to the temporal lobe. So it's a closed circuit. This is exactly what was described by Papes. So it's a hypocampal. Mamilo, thalamo, cingulate, hypocampal circuit, close the circuit. So the, the beauty of this dissection is to, to see these kind of things that sometimes are very theoretical, and then you, we see them in real, so I, I like this a lot. And then you can, and then dissection of the middle aspect, you can remove, remove what interests you, for example, for this, uh, this dissection of the, um, of the limbic, limbic circuit. Uh, you have the same same thing here, the circuit of papes with different portions and the thalamic tract, the thalamic radiations. So uh, we did the, the main uh, components of this hemispheric white matter, of the same same level center from the uh, lateral aspect to the medial aspect. There are a lot of important things here. And then I will just, for a summary, this is the end of the lecture. I will uh, review this for you, uh, with you with some different pictures. So this is lateral aspect, partial dissected. So frontal is there, posterior is there. So arcuate fascicles and some other horizontal fibers of the SLF complex. We see uncinate, IFOF, inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, some gray matter islands of the posture, centrifugal fibers of the uh, external capsula. And then we get deep. We take out most of the external capsula. We see the lateral aspect of the putamen. Then you see uh, the superior limit of the putamen, the transition with the uh, corona regiata. You see how the corona is deeper to the arcuate fasciculus through this window we, we opened. And then we are going to take the lenticular nucleus out. We take the putamen. You see is there is still gray matter there, but the gray matter now is different is more clear and firm. And then you see you have the level of the lateral aspect of the pallidum, and then you take the pallidum, and then you take what the rest of the putamen, and you get the uh, internal capsula completely naked with the beautifully the, um, the corona radiata. You see the limit, the transition between internal capsula and corona radiata, and you see the imprints that were uh, left by the different components of the ventricular nucleus. You see that the putamen was there, right? And you see that the pallidum was there with the different parts, lateral and medial pallidum. And something interesting thing here, you see how the anterior fibers of the uh, internal capsule are oblique anteriorly. The genome contains mostly vertical fibers. The posterior portion of the internal capsule contains uh, fibers and so there's anterior limb, genuine and posterior limb, and then you have the retroventricular portion of the internal capsule and the subventricular portion of the internal capsule. And in that place, we will find uh, fibers from the callosal radiations, for example. And you see that 
everything that is coming from the cortex is getting inside the um, cerebral pedunculum and the mesencephalum and crossing, of course, the uh, optic plane. So this is a very nice for, an, uh, for a topographical anatomy. So this is one of the last slides, it's also for topography. I like this very much. I was talking to you, this is a coronal cut. I was talking to you about this, uh, of the corpus callosum and this bulging, uh, the level of the, uh, the coronary jata. And so I know that this bulging there corresponds to the roof of the ventricle. And then if I want to find the ventricle, I have to come under it. So it's a very nice, this kind of dissection help us to understand the relationship, for example, of the ventricle with the caudate nucleus, with the putamen, with the uh, internal capsula, and actually how things are uh, together and actually much closer that we could imagine. Okay, so uh, this is a, a dissection of the thalamic radiations. And this is also again the slides that summarize those main bundles of the lateral aspect. And I think that's, that's all. Uh, we came then from the lateral aspect to the medial, medial aspect. So the goal is uh, even if I don't have DTI, I have only morphological images. If I have a case there, I have a tumor, I have a carbonoma or something, and I don't have DTI, I look at this MRI, white matter seems amorphous to me. I don't see the bundles, my I know they are there. I know they are there. So uh, if, if I'm going to surgery without diffusal image, that's the case in many centers, then you're going with a wake surgery, with ultrasound, with fistulation. You look at this, and then with some anatomy, you know that you have fibers of SLF complex. SLF1 will be there, SLF2 will be there, the ventral or preocular component will be there, arc weight will be there, IFOF and uncinate will be there. Okay, so these are callosal fibers. Uh, we had the internal capsule there, have an external capsule there. And I can imagine, and no, not imagine, know where they are, and plan my and, and plan my procedure. So I hope you, I hope you liked it. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's still so it's interesting fun. subject. <laughs> it thank you very much. Was uh, again, big, big honor for me. For me, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Igor. That was a mind blowing lecture. Takes some skill to do such sort of dissections and uh, demonstrate the clinical correlates of various neurosurgical deficits in human brain. We really thank you. We are really privileged to have you today here and to hear you. I think if there are any questions for the uh, speaker, you may please ask. Hello. Have, yeah, who is this? Uh, Professor Dr. Mohammed Fahmi from Alexandria, Egypt. Welcome. Uh, Please, uh, actually, can I talk right now? The voice is okay? Yeah, it's okay. Please ask your question. Uh, first, I would like to thank him. He gave us a very good lecture. Uh, but I need uh, to just uh, point out just a little remark. <clears throat> the relation or topographic relation of the cerebral cortex with the Skull, I mean the coronal and the sagittal uh, suture is very important for uh, planning of the surgical osteoblastic plan. I think this is a very important point. However, it does not uh, um, make any burden on just if he just mentioned it maybe later on. I mean the topographic relation of the cranial bone with the cerebral cord. I am clear. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Completely agree. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, in a lecture like this, we have to 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 focus to choose what you're going to to talk. We know when we do our uh, courses uh, for for white matter for intrinsic cerebral anatomy. We have some uh, work stations with the students uh, in which then they look at the examinations and then we try to find the landmarks. Uh, just as you said, the suture, bone, and also brain structures. Sure, 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 sure. 
That's true. Uh, I cannot uh, places, it is completely right. Yeah. That's true because most of the places do not have a neural navigation to pinpoint your tumor inside the skull and to plan your craniotomy. Mostly it is uh, planned according to the distance from the uh, fixed bony landmarks or the sutures. So that is very important. Thank you, Dr. Professor Fahmi. May I just comment? I think the, yes, the concept, yes. this concept is, um, he addressed uh, is more or less the same. It's extremely important. When you use the landmarks of the bone to find the gyri, is exactly the same principle I'm using the landmarks of the cortex to find the white matter facility. It's just the same thing, but it's applied to see in tricks or brown at me. Anatomical correlation, yeah. yeah. That's what he said. Uh, are there any further questions? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, who is this? Hi, oh, I'm Ali Alavi, neurosurgeon from Australia. Please, Dr. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thanks for an interesting presentation. I, I personally have a lot of interest in DTI and frequently using it. But the only question I have, do you have any experience with the fiber tracking in the spinal cord? I don't, I don't. Uh, um, I have some specimens being prepared for that section, but this, they will be the first ones. I don't have. Okay. You, you do? Will be, uh, I had some fMRI and DTI done in the spinal cord, in cervical uh -huh. spine, but I found it very difficult to do it in the thoracic and and also lumbar area because of the movement artifact you have from the bowel and from the from the lungs. Well, it would be very nice to see what's your experience from the you know from the actual cadaveric specimen, and then we can correlate it with the fMRI and DTI. Yeah. Uh, I will do the first ones, uh, but I don't have any results yet. And then uh, I think something that may be interesting, uh, if it's possible for you, is uh, example postmortem DTI. With post mortem, you can program very long sequences, you know, uh, yeah. and high field. Uh, maybe you can get, uh, you know, with smaller voxels and whatever, and uh, good images. But I don't have any experience with this. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alvi. Uh, my colleagues of the education committee can please come in lieu. Sachin? Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure. Please do. Yeah, so Dr. Egad, congratulations. That was a very wonderful lecture. I understand the difficulties, being, having a love for the white matter track, the difficulties to present white matter anatomy on this kind of platform where there is a true 2D kind of a view. You need a very good 3D view with a pointer to teach uh, in detail white matter anatomy. And the best way I want to tell, being as a part of the committee, to all the residents, I think every resident should go and do a white matter dissection course. It's very, very important. It introduces you to a whole new world of neuroanatomy. So please go and join that or do that. I have one small question, Dr. Eager, not to offend you, but uh, I, I was reading more about white matter uh, tracks and I came across this uh, uh, paper called the Connectome Project. Now there is this doctor called Michael Shugru and what he's doing is he's collecting a lot of MRIs some of them are pathological, some of them are non-pathological, like a normal. And then he's studying that, and based on the MRI, he's doing a DTI study, and then he's introducing or innovating new, new, new tracks. So I don't know whether these kind of tracks are really present there, whether have you seen this kind of new tracks in your uh, cadaver dissection course? What's your opinion uh, based on that, like for the resident point of view? Yeah, thank you. Very, very interesting comments. Uh, there is a lot of things inside. <laughs> well, I, I will just, uh, first I will comment on the methodology, okay? So, uh, some people, they are using C, uh, sites of activations on fMRI as seeds for tractography. That's what I understand of your comments, right? Uh, and uh, I've seen some interesting results, but I've also seen some others, they are difficult to, they don't match with the real anatomy, uh, the real logic. So this is very interesting, uh, very in interesting methodology, but it must be coupled with the anatomical constraints, you know? And uh, to, see, to say that area A is connected to area B, 
it must be something between them physically, okay? So I remember that there was one paper, PINAS paper, good, good uh, journal. Uh, they, were, they were using this methodology for uh, some language, you know, paradigms. And in this paper, a lot of importance for the ventral, ventral stream semantic processing was a lot, a lot of importance was um, was uh, done was um, given to the MDLF middle stone of a sequence. It's just okay, it's just okay. But in the whole paper, they didn't even mention the IFOF, which is very nowadays very acknowledged as a you know extremely important bundle for uh, for uh, for semantic processing. And MEDLF, you know, as our neurosurgeons, we have performed uh, temporal lobectomies. When you perform a temporal lobectomy, you catch the MEDLF and you don't have a semantic disturbance, right? So th this is a, a very interesting methodology, but it must be coupled with the reality, okay? So this is just an example. And the second part of your question is, yeah, sometimes I find things that I don't, don't know really what it is, but that, that's is the interesting part, right? Because uh, white matter, uh, we are building the functional anatomy of the white matter in this century. When you would talk about anatomy, people say, oh, anatomy, research in anatomy. Everything is done. There is nothing to research. But in white matter, it's not like this. It's a lie. In white matter, there's a lot of things that we don't know. In, in the lab, and in the MRI, in the MRI, there are a lot of uh, no drawbacks and problems with DTI, DSI, blah, blah, blah. So we are building, we're living this story. This is story. This is the beauty of the thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like your idea that there's a lot to innovate, research, and to know in the brain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, it takes a lifetime to learn the brain, Sachin. That's what I have to acknowledge. Yeah, Professor, I fear. Uh, Maybe you should come in, Professor Wright. Can you hear us? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, please do. Please. Here go, my good friend. Hello, Ike. So nice to see you. I was watching you. It was uh, good to see you in action again. I mean, good to see tours again. <laughs> <laughs> you, give, you, you gave your lecture in this exact place. You were sitting here when you gave your lecture, when you were in tour. Yeah, 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 I remember. I remember yeah. that. I, 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 can you tell the audience about tours, please? Oh, it's a fantastic place. It's WFNS Neuroanatomy Laboratory. I've been there for maybe three times now. Once uh, uh, with Nikolai, once with uh, the team, the whole team, and once with uh, Igor and uh, Chris. Um, but it's a fantastic place, beautiful, a lot of uh, beautiful uh, places around to hang around. And the lab is amazing and Igor is amazing. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all I can say. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you giving a lecture for ACNS. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so there are no more questions, we can wind up. On behalf of ACNS and the President of Cicato, I would sincerely thank you for coming here and giving a mind-blowing lecture about the deep white matter tracks of the brain. Uh, we learn a lot from you. Hope to continue your support for the ACNS in the future as well. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Igor. Thank you. My pleasure. It was a great honor. Thank, thank you. you thank, thank all of you. I'd like to show what's on tomorrow, Raja. Can you explain? Yeah, sure. yeah. Tomorrow, we, uh, tomorrow at the same time, we have uh, Professor Subin from uh, Kwashen Hospital Fudan. Professor Subin is a very famous neurosurgeon from China. He is talking about simplifying the STMC bypass. Professor Subin perhaps hold the world record for the largest number of bypass for myomyo disease, more than 4,000 bypasses. So it would be a great honor to have Professor Subin. Hopefully, Professor Yoko Kato will also join tomorrow. And so we'll meet tomorrow, everybody. Once again, thank you, Professor Igor. Thank you very much. 
And John, over to you. Thank okay. you, John. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Thank you, yeah. John. See you. Have a nice day.